to day-to-day -day chess. The first game of round four of the World Cup in Baku took place today. Compared to other days, I had big, big trouble deciding for a single game. So I'm going to attempt to use my reporter skills, which I don't know if I have, but you're, you guys are going to let me know, I hope. And I'm going to attempt to give you a detailed report of all the games in this round. Let's see what happened. The first game that finished was between Karyakin and Andrekin. Andrekin had white. Uh, in this position, Karyakin, after 12 moves, offered a draw and Andrekin went for it. Could it be that Andrekin is more confident with black pieces? Or do they both think that it would be better to take some rest and give it all in the Rapid and Blitz games? All of this remains to be seen. Another um, game that um, took place and was quite dry was between Giri and Wojtaszek. The game and, uh, happened to reach this position. After b5, Giri went for a little tactical trick here, knight b6, improving the position of his knight, bringing the knight towards d5. Of course, now, you know, your rook is being attacked, so you need to be careful. Queen d2, now of course black cannot capture the knight because queen takes d5, having a double attack. So, um, in this position, Wojtaszek just developed another piece, and Giri attempted to make this trade to start putting pressure on d6 by playing rook d1, and um, tried to use the weakness of the d6 pawn. But uh, he could not do anything against Wojtaszek's defense, and uh, eventually on move 35, which was in this position, they agreed to a draw. It's, it's quite hard for white to improve this position, but the same is for black. He could not try to play for a win here. The position is quite close. There's not uh, enough uh, space for, the, for whites or black's rooks to enter in the um, camp of the other side, so... They agreed to a draw in this position. Tomorrow should be quite interesting, given that uh, Wojtaszek has uh, won a um, game with White. Uh, in his previous match, he beat uh, Granda Zuniga, so there will be, be some cool thing to follow. Um, another game between Yakovenko and Elianov took a similar path to this one. Let's see what happened in that game. In... This position, um, Elianov played a4, and Yakovenko started seeming started pressing a little bit by with rook c4, putting pressure on both a4 and d4 pawns. But um, Black had a good um, choice of of defense. He chose the active defense. So okay, he defended the pawn for the moment because it was hanging. Uh, but now he came rook a5, rook b5. He activated his rook. He didn't stay and waited for white to play rook b4 and then rook c4. He brought his, his rook himself. And of course, the rook in a5 is also attacking c5. So he's, uh, forcing somehow white to, to, to maintain his, his rooks on the c file. And, uh, white tried to, to get some, um, to create some weaknesses on the other side of the board. But, um, he was, not very successful with that. Black just activated his rook. Now the bishops are coming. Some trades. And um, although Black gave away a pawn, as you can see in this position, he gave it to have his bishops active. Remember, when you have a bishop there, it is very important to keep your bishops um, active and open up the position so that they can start doing something. And, okay, eventually the game... Uh, the pieces started getting traded off, and here in this position, after, after rook takes f5, which was actually move 41, um, the, both the players agreed to a draw. The next game that I'm going to talk about is between Maxime vachier lagrave and Wesley So. It seemed that in this position, um, White had a little edge because he has the bishop pair, but um, his problem is that black doesn't really have weaknesses in his position. So although h5 doesn't seem a natural move because black is putting 
another pawn on the white square, the same square of his bishop, but h4 is also ensuring his knight in f5, making sure no g4 is going to happen. And uh, although, uh, so Vashil Agrav has to start creating some weaknesses, so he attempted to do that with queen a4, a6, queen d7, activating his rook, but now Wesley saw just played queen e7, um, asking a queen trade, and following the queen trade, if you are not trading the queens in this position and go back, maybe I will start pushing the pawns, although, you know, I, I can just stay quiet. There's no way of improvement really for white in this position. So once the uh, queens got traded off the board, uh, Maxim Vashilakhov attempted some attacks on the black's d6 pawn, but without very much success. And um, Wesley saw made sure he traded off as many pawns as possible. And eventually the game ended in this position. Once they reached move 40, they agreed for a draw. Actually, king e4 was probably not played. It's probably when they decided to put the kings in the uh, opposition. Maybe they got put wrong or maybe king d4 was played. But anyways, they agreed on a draw here. The next game that I want to talk to you about is the game between Mamed Yarov and Karwana. Mamed Yarov surprised everyone and many said he's the man of the day after defeating world number five player Fabiano Caruana with a beautiful attacking game. Although there seemed to be some unorthodox opening here with bishop g5, Karana's reaction was drastic, and it seemed that he tried to pu punish Mamedyarov here. He played knight e4, bishop f4, c5. Okay, so far maybe it's still all right trying to play some kind of Benoni system. Now queen a5 check, and now f5-2. I mean, I personally haven't seen this uh, this kind of pawn structure. You see it sometimes, but but not not in this way. And uh, what happened from this position after f3, black, white just started improving the position of his pieces. All he did was getting the space, e4, okay, and now just development. That is it. That is it. And Fabiano Caruana didn't seem to have a clear plan. His pieces just after bishop e2, knight h5, bishop g5. Okay, he's first allowing this doubling of his pawns to the king, which is still all right, let's say. But now, okay, he has to try to open up the e-file too to do something. But here just simply, you know, the position got to, to this position. And um, in this position, as you can see, all white pieces are really ready for the attack, whereas black pieces most of them are on the other side of the board, not doing very much. Um, Fabiano Caruana might have been under some big pressure to, to try to win this game, maybe, and um, he simply didn't do much. Whereas um, Mamedyarov just simply, as you can see, with every single move, just improvement. I'm going to just go over this game so that you can see every single move. G3, what's the idea? Well, we just want to bring the knight into play. Knight takes g3. Knight h5. Every move. Knight takes g7. Of course, now he's just winning this h6 pawn. So, of course, he just eliminated the defender. Bishop takes h6. Knight g5 check. Rook to g1. Knight to f7. Every single move is just... And, okay, the final position was this one, where the mate... To h8 is unstoppable, and you, of course you cannot capture my queen, unfortunately. So um, definitely deserves deserves some uh, beauty prize for this game. It's very nicely played by Mamedyarov. Okay, so passing on to the next game, the game between Nakamura and Adams. That game, in my opinion, was supposed to be a draw. It was quite an unexpected result. Uh, in this position, it seems that it's, this position seems to be quite equal. And um, 
Adams played this king f7 that I believe it's a big, big mistake. He should have kept his rooks active. There's no time to bring the king. Uh, there's still rooks on the board and you have to be quite careful. When there's still rooks on the board, there still can be some mating, mating patterns or, or lots of checks that lead to, to material loss. So there's really no need for the king to come towards the center right now. Um, king, rook to b3 had to be played here. And, um, simply, simply, you know, if you play rook to c1, Okay, I start pushing that pawn. I have a free passed pawn and you're going to have to go get it. And the more pawns I trade as black because I have more islands of pawns. As you can see, I have one, two, three, four. Whereas you as white, you only have one island here and another one there. So me as black, I'm a little bit worse here giving the pawn structure, but I do have some some advantage i have a free pass pawn it's for very far so you're gonna have to go get that one unless you want to have some troubles later and uh, this should should have ended in a draw but okay with with a nice play after after king f7 by by nakamura um he was able to defeat uh, adams and um, eventually just you know just the pieces got traded and he started pushing the pawns and although you have this a7 pawn far away i have three against one here and it's not very easy for you to push it because your king doesn't have easy access towards helping your pawn pushed so in this position adams resigned um let's see if he can come back again like uh, like in other matches and win the game a crazy game was between Ding Liren and Wei Yi. Very complicated. It seemed that the advantage went on from one side to another for a couple of times. Like, for example, in this position, um, Black played Bishop C6, which was a blunder, in, in my opinion. Because here, after rookie 2 check, where do you go? It seems that you have to go to D3. And after this, I'm playing rook e7. You're going to see why I needed to give the check first in a second. This knight has no moves besides d6. I don't think you want to put it in h8. So knight d6 check, king here. Now that knight is attacked. So wherever you put it on this diagonal is going to be... If you just put it there, okay, it's going to be lost immediately. So now you can see why I gave the check to attract the king here. And uh, if you don't go there, if you go knight to c4... I can just, uh, again, bishop e2 check, king go somewhere, and um, trade here. And after c6, I simply have a pawn up. Maybe I'm not winning with black, but I have big, certainly big chances. So this was a big, uh, big miss by, um, in this position by uh, Vei. So he, he played... Um, he played bishop c6 here and white just started pushing pushing the pawns and here another bad move capturing the pawn so this is definitely gonna give us a good idea of what we should not do go for pawns if we're giving our opponent some counterplay and now white has just used the fact that he has this pawn in h6 and with that pawn he won actually the game and how did he do that? Well, now I was threatening to trade the queens and taking g6, or taking g6 and then trade the kings, queens, uh, rooks and h7. And now the rook just got activated there. And now this one is coming. G. And there's no way to stop the h pawn. So in this position, um, they he had to resign so from a position where he could have had some chances to win he ended up just letting white activate his pieces and okay and the last game that finished was between Svidler and Topalov uh let me put that last final position that was that I'd like to show you and this was the position it was a Marathi differently from previous games of the tournament topolos started weakening his position a lot and allowed white to create white to create a pass pawn on the c file which eventually helped svidler win the game the so from this position they got to something like this and here svidler pushed c5 followed by 
c6, and eventually he won the game. If